build the abs. Train them like you're trying to build them and get them stronger, not like you're trying to get them to have tons of stamina and endurance. And what you'll find is they'll build and they'll be much more visible. Just like a building any muscle, run it in a bulk. So give yourself a calorie surplus while you're really trying to build and then go to a cut afterwards. And, and reveal that's right. the beauty. Hey, real quick, I'm going to tell you about something interesting, but stay tuned because we talk to some very interesting people about their fitness and health goals, and we give them great advice on how to build muscle and burn body fat. But real quick, I'm going to give away a program right now to one of you viewers. I'm going to give away Map Strong. So here's how you can enter to win. Right now, leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. Do all those things. And if we like your comment, we'll notify you and you'll get free access to Maps Strong. Also, we're running a sale right now on a bundle, Maps Prime, Maps Prime Pro, and Maps Anywhere. All together in a bundle for $99.99. Massive savings. It would normally retail for $360, but right now it's only $99.99. Go check it out. Go to mapsapril.com. All right, here comes the rest of the show. All right, check this out. When it comes to fitness, workouts, exercises, all the commonly accepted methods of training your body, they actually all work, but nothing works forever. Well, that's a bit of a strong statement. All of them? Everything, you know what it is, is well, the commonly accepted, I made sure to put that. I know that's a yeah, painting with no, a broad brush. Right. I mean, that, I mean, I mean, you could even, you could be general like that. I, you technically, uh, jumping around in circles and waving and flailing your arms. <laughs> I don't know if that's will, yeah, this move. I mean, it does it will, uh, warm things up. It will burn calories. Yeah. And if you're not used to training, you may even get a little sore from it, yeah. which in turn could t technically build a little bit of muscle. So um, I think, well, I do want to be clear that this doesn't mean that everything works this as effectively. And this doesn't mean that everything works as long as that's right. Yeah. So some stuff works way better than others. Some yeah. stuff works for much longer than so others. So I put it on a spectrum. You have the jumping around, flailing your arms, doing senseless stuff on this end, and then yeah. you'd have mm -hmm. expertly programmed yes. training program, right? Yes. And Instagram then, influencers expertly programmed. Yeah. So yeah. I, th I guess the real question I want to hear then is for I want to hear from you is where where would you rate a lot of these programs that are that are out there or that you see? Yeah. yeah obviously, it was a very general statement. Um, you know, and I said commonly accepted because I'm referring to like. Someone might say, well, what about like five, five, by, five by five or what about like bodybuilding style training or, you know, what about a powerlifting style of workouts or Olympic style workouts? Oh, I would rate all those on more expertly the programmed. right. Yeah. The yeah. right side of the spectrum. Yeah. Or, if we were or what about someone says, hey, I, you know, I don't exercise now. I'm just going to go walking or cycling or taking an aerobics class. Like everything does work. Again, doesn't mean that everything works the same or is as effective as each other or works the same length of time. But everything has an effect. The the key, I think the key part of the statement is nothing works forever, right? right? Mm -hmm. So even the most expertly programmed workout plan, at some point, if you do it over and over and over again, you'll start to run into some problems. You'll get overuse injuries or there's something lacking that you're not training. So you start to develop weak links or your body just adapts um, completely and it just doesn't respond anymore to, to that same stimulus. I mean, this is why in our programs, we have phases in each of the programs. And this is also why we have so many different programs because as trainers, I mean, gosh, you know, all of us train people for, I mean, a long time, but all of us had clients who were with us for six, seven, eight, you know, I had some clients with me for 12 years. You, you definitely don't do the same workout all 12 yeah, years. No. And even, even though their fitness may not necessarily, I mean, after four or five years of consistency, unless the person wants to work out more or whatever, their fitness level starts to maintain, but you still have to change the workout. Well, and this is where I think coaches like have to, um, we have to negotiate or, or compromise quite a bit too, based off of like what you know that they're going to adapt towards or like they're yeah. going to keep going uh, because they like and they enjoy these certain types of movements and things in their uh, routine. And so it's like, uh, you know that they're con consistently going to be doing this. So it's like, how can we also work in, uh, some of the, uh, you know, more beneficial and, and effective type exercises and workouts alongside that. Well, I think it really, ma their goal matters, yeah. right? Because if, and I've had clients, you know, that stayed on like the same routine for a very long time, but those clients had already reached their goals and were happy. And we were just trying to make sure we do things that had rotational strength, make sure we strengthen their core, make sure they had good shoulder and hip mobility. And like, you could do a lot of the same movements to maintain all that stuff. I think the, the, where it, it becomes a problem is when you have goals that you're trying to achieve, when you're trying to build muscle, burn body fat, and you're trying to go somewhere, yeah. change. If you're trying to make change or progress, 
then then the programming piece becomes even more important. Whereas if you're somebody who's just like, hey, I I, I feel great, I I move great, I just want to stay here. Right. You could write a routine for somebody and to kind of maintain where that. Although it still would be beneficial to. Yeah, modify it, and change and switch it yeah, up. Yeah, because there's always something missing, right? Like, you know, it's if you do the same movements all the time, all the time, even the most beneficial ones, there may be something lacking or maybe there may be a slight like imperfection in your technique to where this imbalance, although you can't tell for a year or two, starts to develop over time, right? Mm -hmm. And then, uh oh, we got to, like, for example, Adam, these clients that you're talking about, I'm sure, you know, every three, six months, maybe even once a year or two, you would have to inject a new movement or something different because they say, oh, you know what, Adam, my knee feels a little funny. Or that's, I mean, that's I, I would do, I would do it, and I would do it mostly just so we didn't get bored of doing the same sure. thing. But I think that the case that I'm trying to make is that if I if you have somebody, and we've said this before, like if you're if you're completely happy where your your fitness goals are currently, and you just want something to follow, like you could follow a routine like mass performance pretty much indefinitely. Yeah, well, that, mean, that's it, a good it, example because mass it, performance is so like, so covers yeah, all the bases. That's right. That's yeah. right. I would never run somebody on anabolic forever no. or mass aesthetic forever. Right. Um, but performance is, and maybe even the new one, symmetry. We we cover so many things that I think for for longevity and health and just overall strength yeah. and movement and mobility in those programs that, and it's phased in so many phases that you could continuously run that and probably stay pretty healthy and fit. Sure. Now, if that same, that same person though is, Hey, I still want to lose some body fat or, Hey, I want to build some muscle. Then it'd be advantageous for us to move into another program. Yeah, like how many times did you guys, even with your own training, try something new and go, this is it. Uh, yeah. This is, I figured it out. And then, you know, uh, three months later, oh, wait, it's not it anymore. It's I got to figure something power. Out. Yeah. I, I think I spent the first 10 years continuously doing that, yeah. you know, fooling myself into thinking that, oh, it must be the low reps. Oh, I it know. must be the high reps. Oh, it must be these moves. When really it's just our body, when it's something that's novel, uh, it sends a signal to adapt and build and strengthen and figure this out. And so it, and it becomes it, so efficient yeah. at what you practice most often. Growth yeah. requires change. And it's, that's the hardest part. You know, it's like, you got to change it up and you get, you get good at something. It's really hard to kind of uh, sh shake it up and do something completely yeah. outside your comfort. In fact, one of the best hacks for people who are experienced uh, with training is to find an exercise that you suck at. Yeah. Like if like you're like, oh, my arms won't grow. And, you know, I've been working out for five years. Find an arm exercise that you're terrible at. And there's your greatest potential for growth and progress, right? Oh, my legs aren't getting any stronger. And I've been doing the same workout for... Tr find an well, exercise you suck at and get good at that. And then watch, you'll start to get those gains. That's right? the crazy part about resistance training, though. You could just make little minor tweaks and all of a sudden your body responds in a completely new way. Yeah, you yeah. know, it's like you add, you haven't done any rotation in your pressing, you know, all of a sudden now it's like you get all this new stability support. It's like, you don't have to do something drastically different, but you can change up like some of these exercises to get all new benefits. Yeah, it's from it. pretty amazing how the human body does such a good job at over time getting so good and so efficient at what you do most often that at some point it becomes easy, right? Like if you've ever, we've talked about this before, you ever work with blue collar workers who've been doing it for, I mean, like my dad did this for his whole life and I'd go to work with this guy and, and other men who were older, I'm talking like in their fifties, and they wouldn't even break a sweat doing things that I would just kill me. You know why? Well, they've been doing it for yeah. years and years and years. Super efficient. Their bodies are so efficient. Nothing bothers them. You know, they're mixing cement and, you know, throwing plaster up on the wall. And meanwhile, I'm over here and forearms on fire, hands are dying and everything. I'm like, what is going on here? Their bodies became so efficient at doing that because they practiced it for so long. Yeah, yep. You know, it's cool stuff. Anyway, how was you guys this weekend? Did you guys have a good one? Yeah, yeah it was dude. good. We threw a, a Easter bash at my house first time. Uh, I saw a lot of kids there. So are those cousins? Yeah, no. So these are our friends. Oh. Um, just random kids. Just random. Strangers. We took them off the street. We <laughs> just ran hey, strangers. kids. Hey, hey you want to find? You want some candy? <laughs> Explore my property. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we we hit eggs all over the place, and uh, you know had a uh, had a bit of a brunch, if you will, with alcoholic beverages and, and whatnot. Mm. And so we did get a drunk text from you. Yeah, I, I, I know. I was like, oh, man. Like, what? I'm like, hey, guys, I'm a little buzzed right now. Yeah, yeah having a did good time. Did you get time. tipsy this weekend? I did. Oh, yeah? I did. But I knew ahead of time, so I did, did take you, my uh, drink the secret sauce before or what? I took it. Oh, but and, and I saved one for Courtney, too, and she made the, the cardinal mistake. And she passed it along to her friend. She didn't do the Z-Biotics? No. She, I was like, I specifically got that for you because I know 
some like because uh they're coming in with like different type of alcohol and drinks like they have this like gin drink that was like somewhat like i don't know holiday appropriate and so it was good <laughs> It was like their thing. Like we're, we're bringing in all these other people that have traditions and stuff. And so they're kind of bringing in their dish, their drink and, and all this. And so I was like, I don't know how this is going to go. So I'm like protecting myself. Yeah. <laughs> you know, with, with their East, are there Easter drinks? Apparently. Not to my knowledge. So look it up, Doug. Maybe there is. That's that's actually new. They, there's associations there. I don't know. I know. I, like, I believe you. It's I just wine, like, right? No. <laughs> there's got to be. I'm going to see. I was, I watched no, it was like drink. It was like gin and tonic and. Uh, and peeps. And, and <laughs> like, have like, like a pineapple. Like a, does it have like a bunny name or something? What's it, What's the name for? Is it? Have no, like, no, you don't remember. There's lime in there. That's that's all I know. Speaking of which, if it, here's what's interesting. So we're not allowed to say that. There's, you're not allowed to say that a product is a hangover fix or cure because yeah. hangovers are actually labeled or registered as like a medical condition, right? So unless it's a medical oh, really? drug, you can't say this like, works on hangovers. Deliberately so say that, you but can't. everybody knows what you're talking about. What you're about. talking it's about. Like, yeah. So here's what's interesting. If you study acetaldehyde, which is the... So when you drink alcohol, you produce this compound called acetaldehyde. And normally, your liver breaks it down, no problem. But if you overwhelm your body's ability to break it down, you get this buildup of acetaldehyde, and that's what they attribute to the all those effects from the hang, the headache, inflammation, the gut, mm. you know, feeling like crap, the depression, all that sh crap, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what Zbiotics does. Zbiotics, these, and this is what people trip out over. Or they don't understand. I should say, these b bacteria have been literally designed, so they're they're engineered to produce compounds that break down acetaldehyde. So you can't say hangover cure, but you can say what it really does, which is it breaks down acetaldehyde. Do you think there's a genetic component? I guarantee there, there is. I be. guarantee some people break down more acetaldehyde than others. Yeah, like as I've I've had some like family members be like, yeah, I kind of noticed a difference, and that, like some people be like, other people go, oh my god, like it was a huge deal for me. For me too. Yeah. I don't do well. Well, with did they not get bad hangovers to begin with? Well, yeah, I've had some people. The case. Yeah, I've had some people like that that they they, they don't even get a bad hanger hangover as it is, and then then they take mm. that and then they're like, oh, I couldn't really tell a difference. Where me, it was. Night and day difference. Look at I had drinks. to explain to her friends, I'm like, this doesn't mean you can drink a lot more. Yeah. Like, it's not about volume. It's just like it helps to kind of mitigate, you know, the next day. I know. Yeah. So look at all these drinks here. These are, are these are Easter drinks. Did you find any gin oh, ones? See? Well, they call them Easter drinks. Oh, it looks like that one right there. What's that Who first this one? one? Uh, mimosa or this one down here? Oh, no, it's not that one. Anyway, okay. they have like 20 Easter drinks here, which wow. tell, tells me... There's any drink will be an Easter drink. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> it's on how you decorate. It, apparently, yeah, you put that's little, what like, peeps, you know, bunny yeah. on there, and it's. it's I think it's people just look for an excuse to drink. It's the swing. Yeah, all it is is alcohol beverage with the spring colors. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah exactly. I know. Yeah. Name one event that there's no alcohol. There's, there isn't an alcoholic. Yeah, see that or candy. I mean, come on, like choose your poison. Bro, I, I, I avoided the candy and so I had the drinks. So. I had so much candy. Did I had you? So, oh my god, bro! I'm literally I. I woke up this morning five pounds heavier. It's all water and blow <laughs> from all the candy because it's because first off, I'm a I'm a cheap candy guy. So I don't know if that, that sounds kind of funny, but everybody made fun of me because like I don't candy corn or something. Yes. Oh, are you serious? Uh, yes. You big candy corn guy? Bro, I like, like jujubes. I like, would be a candy corn I like guy. candy bracelets. You're a guy. I like candy bracelets. I get I like, down with that. That's cool. I like circus peanuts, which what the hell the is circus that? Peanuts? What is that? Anyway. My daddy used to yeah. eat those. It's I I like just garbage, yeah. like all the big crap candy that guy. the kids are like, oh, I don't want this one. Those little root beer ones. Oh. Yeah, those little bottles. Oh, I'll crush oh I like those. I'll crush them. I like those. Yeah, I love all stuff. So I had a ton of candy. Candy corn is like. Oh, I'll eat a bag of that. No, I had a bunch of candy. But so we we went to my aunt's house up in Rockland. And this was uh, the only people missing from this were my sisters and their families and my cousin and my other cousin. So aside from those three, pretty much everybody showed up. So it was like, it was a good 50 something people in my wow. aunt's house. Yeah. Just a big celebration. Just a lot of fun. And then my, obviously I have my son who's 18 months or 17 months old. My brother's son, who's about a year old. And my cousin, Alex, his daughter, who's only maybe six months old. Mm -hmm. So now we got babies in the family. And I love it. I was sitting there at one point and, you know, I was just kind of chilling, watching every, I don't know if you guys do this any, it, now. I do this now as, a, as an older man, I guess. I sit down and watch and I see these babies just get so much love. Like just getting passed around and people are playing with them and the, other, the older kids are playing with them. My son's in heaven because he's an affectionate little guy. So yeah. everybody's kissing him. He's just like, ah, I'm so <laughs> cool. 
Yeah. It was just such a good time. But the amount of candy that I ate was, it was uh, irresponsible. Oh, that's the word I. I know noticed. we had two Easter's basically. So I did the the day before on Saturday. I did it with my brother and his kids, and then you little uh, fatty you. Yeah, dude. But hey, I, I, I stayed away from the candy you. though. My. <laughs> My kids are like, hey, hey, you deserve that one, You know bro. what? Hey, you started working out and eating right, bro. Now yeah. the fat jokes are coming back. <laughs> I, I, I wear it like a badge. I dude. came in this morning. He was working out. Uh-oh. Uh, Adam's all one again. Bro, I'm, no, I'm like, I'm derailed for the last week ever since I, I hurt myself, man. That's, I've, I've actually, I've never, I've never strained those muscles in my life before. That's the first time that I've ever had yeah. an injury like that. Those intercostal muscles yeah. are, once you, 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 you like, uh, what is it? Strain one? Yeah. It sucks because name and exercise didn't involve you like stabilizing your yeah. ribcage. And especially like rotating, trying oh, to rotate. No. Oh, it's, and it's, it's lingering now. I'm, I'm coming up on a week now. Now I'm still like, I do some isolation exercises, so I'm still moving. I'm staying on my diet. So it's just frustrating because I had great momentum going right into yeah. it. But classic example of all the stuff that we talked hey, to our you, audience about. You were saying with your son, cause he's older now, now he's getting into the Easter egg hunt. Yeah. Yeah. So is he all like, like, does he know what's in the egg and all that stuff? Well, we don't, we do different stuff, right? So we do toys and money. Oh. So there's no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do money too. We yeah, we do too. We, yeah. we do. Everyone, all the adults know to bring one dollar bills and like and a couple fives or whatever. Because we have a couple more expensive eggs, and then uh, and then for the little kids like Max, we put like little monster truck cars and stuff in yeah. there. And so he's so into cars and trucks and things like that that he just. He don't even know he's not getting candy. Like, there's no big deal. Like, there's a couple older kids that they had their own little Easter basket and they're doing their thing, having their candy, but. He's been so trained that that he that doesn't even, if he sees candy he plays with it like it's a toy. Yeah. So it's uh it was great, man. No, and he's he, this was the first year where like he understood what was happening, you know that we were So he was eggs. excited to go find Oh him. yeah, yeah, it was so cute, dude. It was so fun to And I'm so lucky because the 2 days before he got really really sick, he got a fever, projectile vomiting, like mm. he was just a disaster. We were supposed to go out to my mom's on Saturday and I, I had to cancel because on Friday, Saturday, he was a mess. So on Sunday we were supposed to host and Katrina like messaged her family said, Hey, uh, Max has been really sick the last two days. Uh, maybe somebody else host. And then if we can make it, we can make it. If he's doing better, if not, we don't want to have it at our house with him that sick yeah. and then potentially just being a mess. Right. But he woke up like feeling great and uh, oh, doing much better. Dude, he did this thing. It was so like my heart dude just like totally like melted he was it was he was like literally projectile vomiting like really most of i've ever seen him throw up before i felt so bad for him and at one point it was the second time in the same night where he first threw up in our bed so we'd strip all the sheets and everything like that and then in his bed and the second time he threw him in his bed he was like he finished throwing up and then sniffling he's like I'm sorry, mommy. Oh, oh come on. God, Why you got to crush me like I that right like, now, bro? Oh, bro. My mom's like, it's okay, dude. It's okay. You're okay. Oh, that's yeah. the worst, dude. Yeah, yeah. He's that's all... the worst because he feels bad yeah, he feels for bad. being sick. Yeah, yeah. So it was so it was Oh, I can't so, do that. So sad to what see him. What a cute him, little guy. Yeah, man. see him like that. But, oh, that's... but yesterday he was good. So he was. Uh, he had a great He had a great day. He had a blast. It was so fun. Kids are all... funny how they bounce back from if I, well, if I if I projectile vomited, even if I was okay the next day, you got to give know. me three days. And he's really yeah. not healed because he was he, last night. We were up with him last night because he was coughing and hacking really bad. So, but he just it was nice. He had a nice window that morning all day on Easter. He seemed like he was a hundred percent again. But then by the nighttime, mm. it set in, which I'm sure he was wore out because yeah. he pushed himself through it Man. when he probably shouldn't have. No, but. we we uh, uh, we had a good time with family, and then Aurelius did the. <laughs> You know, Easter egg hunt, but he's so young, he doesn't know what's right, going on. Right. So he's just getting the eggs and putting them in the basket. Doesn't even know, like, there's anything in the egg. So finally, I'm like, open the egg. And he's like, looking at me. I'm like, open it. So then he like opens it and there's candy in there, but he doesn't know it's candy, right? Yeah. So there's these, I don't know if have you guys had these nerd covered jelly beans. Nerd covered. Nerd covered. Jelly. Remember, no, you know, nerds, right? Of course. Okay. So it's, it's a jelly bean on the inside. Yeah. But it's nerds candy on the outside I mean, we had oh something similar it was from seas and it had little like uh i don't even know how to describe them they're like little balls yeah on the outside yeah it was kind of like, like that so yeah. like hard kind of candy that was always like a staple like seas candy makes them and oh. they're like jelly well, filled they're I'm really a, good i'm gonna tell you bro i, I mean i got diabetes yesterday yeah. so <laughs> yeah. but anyway I, I open it right and he's looking at it he doesn't know what it is he's yeah. like oh what's that so i'm like i'm gonna i'm gonna give him a little tiny taste or whatever so I smashed some of my fingers so he gets a little bit and I yeah. put it in his mouth. And you can, at first you could tell he's like trying to figure it out. And then, so we got it on camera and then he's like, 
<laughs> big old oh. smile on his face. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, more. And he does it, you know, he does sign language with the he's like, more. I'm like, you're done. <laughs> Do you know what I you know what I think is really fascinating is how okay, so I think I, I shared on the show a while ago that I was introduced to the uh, cinnamon rolls from Costco. I think yeah. I told you guys about oh, yeah. Like They're just to die for, right? They're amazing. And um, I hadn't had any since the last time I brought it. Well, uh, since I've been back being consistent with my training, anytime I'm on my training that consistent, I always dial in the diet, right? So I've been really good for the last, I don't know, three, four weeks or so. And uh, somebody brought those cinnamon rolls. And dude, I couldn't even finish one and it destroyed me. Yet I was able to have it the the two times before, uh, prior when my diet was kind of out of whack. Destroy you how? Gut? Yes. Oh. Just, but I, I notice this all the time. Anytime there's, there's, there's foods, I find it so interesting how the body adapts and like you eat shit that doesn't agree with you, your body gets adapted to it and it, it can handle it better than it. Like, you know, certainly the, the symptoms will be more subtle than when, if you've been on a really strict diet and eating really no, there's truth to this. clean yeah. whole foods and then you introduce it again to Too it, much. fucks you up. I know. Like I could have ate two of those cinnamon rolls just three, four weeks ago and maybe I felt a little bit upset or what, yeah. but this just destroyed no, me after one. Just like your gut bacteria like I think reacting that, crazy? I think what? that might be it. And I think there's a slight immune reaction. I think huh. that you're, you just sensitize your body a little bit okay so you know that's what i would i would think it's just like when you pull off a caffeine for a while pull off a marijuana for a while then reintroduce those things it's like well it's like okay so you know with uh food allergies what they're what they've been doing a lot of now with kids is they'll do this like with peanut allergies i know because my my godson has it he's peanut out and they got and he's cured essentially cured it's not cured but the whole process was like real slow yeah he was severely allergic to peanuts like really bad so they would give him a microscopic amount in the hospital wow. at first to see if that was what you know fine and then gradually over the course of like a year or longer so this is over a long period of time they would up the dose wow. and a couple times he had a mild reaction and for him mild as he would vomit or whatever but they would still kept up this thing to the point now where he has to have a teaspoon of peanut butter every day now and so long as he does that he now is no longer allergic to peanuts. So if he stopped, like it would like come back. That's what like, they think. Force? They yeah. think if they stop completely, then it could come back. So I'm wondering if there's some How kind of immune react response. I've done it enough times that I know there's something there. Yeah. I can't I can't prove exactly how or why it does it, but I've I've done this enough times where I've gone on and off of a really strict diet mm -hmm. and then allowed things to come in and out. And I experienced it a lot when I was competing because I was on such a, a, a tight regimen. And then I, after the show, I'd go enjoy certain things. Yeah. And boy, it just it just destroys me. You know, after fast, after a long fast, that'll happen. Right? If I do like a 72-hour fast. After a fast, I have to do like soup, broth. Yes. Anything like solid, otherwise it's sensitive. Right through me. Yeah. Don't do like a, a triple cheeseburger. That's what like you did. <laughs> <laughs> He did a 72 hour fast. Dude, I got a triple cheeseburger. Fucked me up. Oh, dude. <laughs> oh, That's a good time. Anyway, I got a cool um, observation on um, commonly communicated studies in the fitness space. I, I was, the other night, I was uh, laying down and I was reading studies on muscle activation, compare exercise versus exercise. You guys have seen these, right? Like, what works the upper chest more, like incline dumbbell press or flat, you know, or, or incline barbell press, or what works the lats better, mm -hmm. pull downs to the front versus pull downs to the back. What know, are they using to measure though? Well, what they do is they do they do measure muscle activation. That doesn't tell the whole story. Yeah. Okay, but nonetheless, they can see if they're similar enough, like uh, pull down to the front versus pull down to the back. One will work the lats more than the other. You know, overhead press, you know, in the front of the head versus the back of the head. Which one works the shoulders more? And I'm reading these studies and, you know, having done a lot of these exercises and practiced them, it really, something interesting dawned on me. I'd love your guys' opinion on this. So let's use an overhead press, for example, okay? Okay. A behind the neck press versus an overhead press to the front. Which one requires more mobility, skill, and practice? Behind, behind, behind the head. Right. Yeah. In fact, there's a lot of practice required to get into the groove, to learn how to do it right, before you can actually feel it the right way. Yeah. Same thing with the pull down. Like if you've ever done a pull down to the front versus a pull down to the back, pull down behind the neck, it takes practice, but eventually I can really feel my lats, but it takes practice, right? right. So I'm looking at these studies and I realize something. They're taking people, having them do these, do these exercises, and many of them, they're just college-aged males, have never done or really worked out with these exercises. Mm -hmm. So when you give a group of guys, and maybe they're college-aged guys, so they're not out of shape or anything, but they're not like consistently lifting weights. They're not into it like fitness guys. If you compare an easier to a harder exercise in terms of skill and technique, 
the easier exercise is going to show up as being more effective mm -hmm. because the harder exercise takes practice. Right. If you really want to feel and get and be effective with like a behind the neck pull down, for example, yeah. you know, it's it's going to take you when longer. You're not familiar with it, yeah, you're going to you're going to be less efficient with it. Right? Yes. Too, and you're not going to know like really how to, um, you know, shuttle and, and use the right amount of force and be able to get, um, you know, that kind of response versus like, you're just already, you know, immediately familiar with. Totally. Exercise. Like think about, like, especially from a bodybuilding perspective, right? Like Adam, like how many exercises have you done that are working a particular part of the shoulder or the back, but it takes practice before you can even feel it that way because it's complicated and well, it requires course. technique. Well, especially skill. when you're trying to separate a part of the shoulder, right? Yeah, exactly. And focus on that. So what? So you're. So what? Okay. First of all, which one was more? Was it the what we? Yeah. So I the one study that I looked at was a uh, pull down to the front versus pull down to the behind the head. Okay. And, and they said, oh, pull down to the front, uh, activate the lats a little bit more than to the front, and because it's more safe, then that's the better exercise. But I'm like, okay. You're like That's not the whole story. Not the whole story. And what they said is you know, technically true. It's more complex. So one is definitely safer generally than the other. But I know behind the neck pull downs, it took me a while to really be able to feel it in my lats because it's, yeah. it's a very technical I, exercise. I, I don't, you know, do you think that you get a better contraction coming in the front than you do from behind too? I, I almost feel like you're your shoulder blades almost get in the way of each other when you're when you're peeled all the way back and you squeeze versus when I pulled down. I don't know. It's a, a well. I all, all I'm saying is is that that may be true for some people. But all I'm saying is like depending on the exercise, it's not fair. If you wanted to make a fair comparison to like a, a standing shoulder head uh, overhead press to a standing behind the neck overhead press, you'd have to take people that were very well versed in both. You can't just take people off the street because everyone's going to do the behind to the front better than they do behind the neck. Yeah. And you're going to see different muscle activation as a result of that. So that was just my whole thing. Did I, it show, I mean, did you see all the controls too? Like, it, No, it was literally college age males. That's and they, all I gave Yeah, you. and they, they weren't like, uh, you know, that they'd been lifting weights for years or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. I want to, if I, it's if I want to play a factor, I mean, if you're to. less familiar with it. Yeah, I mean, but, but again, it, yeah, because of morphology or whatever, like there, I'm sure there's variances with how people yeah. like experience and feel contraction, but still like, yeah, if you're not even familiar with that exercise, that's gotta be a downside to it immediately. It's, it is. And it's going to show up. Yeah. Like, I, like if I take somebody who's really good at squatting and knows good muscle, uh, mind to muscle connection, I bet you, I could tell them and, and look at it with the machine and say, feel it more in your quads. And then I'd say, okay, now same sure. exercise, feel it more in your glutes. For sure. And I bet you'd see two different measurements. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. So that's my point. My point is you take untrained people and you have them do an, an easier exercise and a harder exercise or a harder version of that exercise. The easier one's going to show up better mm -hmm. because I get they're able saying. to do it I versus the other one. Yeah, you know? that makes sense. That, yeah, that makes, sense. makes yeah. sense. I think that that's just a hard one to try and compare. I'm trying to think of a better a better exercise. I was just be thinking along those lines, you know, because yeah. there's a lot of exercise, like like dips, for body weight dips, for example. I I've seen studies showing that the pec activation on body weight dips is bad, but it's bad only if you don't practice them right and know how to make it, how to right. really feel it in your chest. Because most people, the first time you have them do dips, it's like all triceps and shoulders because yeah. they don't know how to get in the position yeah. to really feel it in the chest. Or even like a bench press. I mean, how many times have you guys taught a bench press and someone doesn't even oh, feel it yeah. in their chest at yeah. all? So you can make that same exact movement, forget changing the, the bar path at all. And just by them knowing how to activate their chest can get a tremendous amount more exactly. chest activation. So it's like a huge flaw that I saw in that. Because if I if I ever look at a study like that again, what I want are people who are well-versed in both exercises. That's the only fair comparison. Otherwise, you know, I'm not going to see it. Like, you know, uh, I just started fair. trying to do those behind-the-neck presses again, too. It's funny you say that. Um, what do you think about them? I, I like it. It's difficult. You know, it's yeah. not, not something I've practiced since, like, college. So... Um, Olympic lifters do them a lot, don't they? Yeah, they do them a lot, and they'll yeah they'll they'll do yeah they'll do like a power version of that too. Mm -hmm. um, which yeah, I'm gonna work my way towards, but it's just because I don't do them. It's like I, I always find my way back to things like that that um, I haven't done forever because it just provides something totally new. I yeah. love to do it on like a light when I know it's a day that I should take it light on yeah. my shoulders. Like maybe I just hammered them on the last time, or I'm still kind of feeling a little bit. Then I'll, I'll you know I'll do I'll do the behind the head. And just real, real light. Start with the forty-five pound bar. That's it, yeah. and slowly yeah. work my way up. Oh, dude, I, I'm so bought in now on doing that with everything. I'm so like, I, I was, I was going heavy for a second there, and then I started feeling my joints. I'm like, what am I doing? It's t I like, I've been doing this. Long I know, I'm so mad at myself for my stupid thing right now, yeah. having that kind of momentum. All for what? 
you know what it is though it gets in your head like totally and, <laughs> totally, and shame bro. on me like with by the that, way i guarantee like, i'm gonna hurt myself again in the future yeah. well you know like what 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 got me was that um i didn't think i was pushing the weight like that 200 pounds on a squat is not a lot of weight for me not for my legs but on that stupid freaking um what you call it what is safety it? bar right the safety, safety squat bar. yeah the safety squat bar it front loads it so much yeah. that it requires it a lot was of, it a long time before, like the you had had you not done it for a while Oh yeah, a long yeah, time. See, yeah, it's been a long time since I've done that. But see, I I've been consistently still barbell back squatting and, and traditional front squatting. So my legs felt really strong. So as I'm moving up in weight, I'm like, and I know that bar always feels a little bit harder. It's a little more challenging, right? So I, I knew I knew I was gonna be squatting as much as I back mm -hmm. squat, but I thought I'd at least get closer to my back squat. But you know what and what it was that gave out was my core. Yeah. It was my legs. My legs could have easily handled significantly more but like a dumbass i'm like i haven't done this in forever i haven't even been doing really good core training either so i didn't have any sort of a support system there to support it but what messed with me was you know you do an exercise like that and you're not initially thinking core i'm thinking yep. legs oh my legs got this this that was way easy next one stack it and up you start to feel up. your freaking you just start to feel good and, yeah yeah you know it's um yep. it, this is a good lesson for anybody watching this right now because remember you're listening to three very experienced coaches and trainers <laughs> who are running into this problem. So if you think you're immune to this, you're not because we're not even immune to this, but I'm now finally, and I, maybe I'm guarantee I'm going to forget this lesson. Cause I always do when I start to feel real, you know, super aggro or whatever. But right now what I'm doing is that when I lift a weight and I go, Oh, that's a little, that's a little easy. I, I go, how can I make it feel heavier? I stopped mm -hmm. adding weight mm -hmm. to the bar. Like, how can I make this feel heavier? Yeah. That's the whole goal now. Yeah. And I'm getting way better results. Now, consider I've been working out forever. So at this point, it's my body responds differently. I think when you first start out, adding weight to the bar well, is really important. I think important. it's, I mean, you want to test yourself initially. And so you got to kind of go through all of that and, and, and get to the point where you don't even need to like have the ego portion of the lift. So you just don't care. It's like whatever benefits me the most. It takes a while right. to get into that headspace. Right. Speaking of which, you're still working out with the kids, <laughs> aren't you? Um, yes. <laughs> I did that this morning. Wait a minute. Are you, what's going on? Like, what'd you do today? I worked out with them. I was just doing dips and pull-ups and, um, I, uh, did some really heavy, um, farmer walks with the trap bar <laughs> just to, you know, just to show that it's what's possible. I have to like show one thing <laughs> that's possible. So it's like, you know, it's the minute mile thing, yeah. right? Like these kids don't even see, they see weight. They don't see that you keep adding weight. You know, it's like you got to show them. <laughs> this is you great. keep putting the weight on. <laughs> so, uh, you know. How heavy did you go, Justin? <laughs> not that heavy, dude. It was like, you know, it was, it was like four plates. But it yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, not that heavy. It's not that bad. Yeah. It, I mean, compared, you know, to yeah. whatever. But it, yeah. So they're doing like one plate. And then I started to see like two plates on there. And I'm like, okay, now we're starting to see like some yeah. people getting it. So <laughs> it, unfortunately, you have to make an example, like a physical example. Yeah. Bro, heavy farmer walks though. Don't, how did you feel afterwards? I'm I'm hurting a little bit. Yeah. Oh, you are. Yeah. I mean, just like just fried. Like I haven't done that. It's a, long a time. CNS workout. Yeah. I can't think you just of get a, fried. Your whole CNS just gets turned on like nothing else. Yeah. I, I couldn't believe. I never thought of it as a muscle building exercise until I did them consistently with Map Strong. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, oh, I, my biceps actually grew from hanging on to heavy ass trap bar. Doing Such a good oh, exercise though to bulletproof your entire body. Though. That's it. Oh, because it's it like that. from neck to toe everything being activated yep. you know and and if you can actually move it up to where you're you're carrying more than your body weight like in your case 400 pounds like talk about bulletproofing yourself for a bunch it, of other movements just that work capacity i just i keep trying to stress to these kids between that and like pushing the sled and pulling the sled and like doing these farmer walks like you need to to be at a really high level of performance but maintain that high level of performance yeah. in games and there's no other way to really reinforce that other than to just like put you in the grind for a longer amount of time. Well, the other thing too is when you first start working out, you know, of course you want to work on form stability, you know, make sure that you have the the control. Once you start to establish that, it, it's really important to add weight to just get stronger. At some point though, obviously that slows down, right? You can't keep getting stronger forever. Yeah. But in the beginning, that's very important to just get stronger, especially when you're, Again, with those other things uh, all being said, right? Good form, good technique, good stability. But especially when you're a, a, a young man, mm -hmm. when you're a young dude, like the potential to add weight to the bar is, I mean, I remember as a teenage boy working out and I would add five pounds to the bar every week, every single week, five pounds of bar every mm -hmm. for a while. 
it happened. Now, remember, I started real low, so it wasn't like that's you know, that's interesting. Yeah. You have to convince them to do that. I would think they would. That was. I would think you would have to hold them back more. That's what I would that's have a guessed. Good point. I didn't think it's that. a different because I remember as a teenage boy, like that, that's we were dumb like that. Like, Bro, oh, I could put more on there. Like, I can't always even, trying to put more on. I can't even convince them to eat more calories. They're, they're <laughs> like, I don't get fat. What? <laughs> I'm like, what? Like, like you need size. Like you're a little twig. <laughs> I'll snap you. You know, like like you need you need some beef, dude. Like I need to work with this here. Like, like you got to be intimidating on some level oh, out in the field. Dude. You got you look like a bunch of little I can't I can't little stick figures I, out there. I can't imagine like Justin taking him to lunch. You know what I mean? Is that what you're gonna order? <laughs> a, ch a chicken a salad? salad? A salad? Uh, that's exactly. You know, what oh, oh, you're getting a burger with one patty? <laughs> okay, oh, one patty, huh? That's yeah. gonna that's gonna do it. Uh, that's for us today. That's funny. Uh, anyway, hey, you know what? Before I forget to to do our commercial, we had uh, Organifi today, and I finally got a chance oh, to right taste the the new green juice. Ooh, so it's, it's it's crisp apple. Hell good. What's the difference? Hell good. So like describe it. Okay, so Doug had it first, and Doug had me disappointed before I got into it because he was just like, ah, I was kind of hoping for more of an apple taste, and so it does. It tastes like the other one with just a, a, like a which hint is of good. Yeah, which is good already, yeah. right? With a nice hint of apple. It could have been more of a sour apple. I think that's what he was looking for. Mm. But I think it's good. I think it's bomb. Does I think you it's, still uh, have a little bit of the mint. The other to one me, it does. It has a kind of a minty apple thing. So it kind oh, of cool. tastes like the original one with a little bit more so of an apple kick to it. For people wondering what the ingredients are in this particular product, the green the blend is organic wheatgrass powder. Uh, organic moringa powder, spirulina powder, chlorella powder, matcha, green tea powder. And then the superfood blend is whole apple powder, uh, coconut water powder, ashwagandha is in there. Actually, it's a good form of ashwagandha. It's the KSM 66. Lemon powder, re, uh, red beet powder, and turmeric is all in there. Oh, I didn't know they had turmeric in there. They do. You know what? Here's another thing that's interesting about this. You might You won't find this on a lot of supplements. There's a company called, let me see if I can read it here. It's, uh, well, it's, it's about what they test is for glyphosate residues. Okay. This is certified glyphosate residue free. So glyphosates are what they spray all over genetically modified plants. And that's what they think is causing the issues with a lot of people. It's because glyphosates have kind of this mild antibiotic. It's basically an herbicide, right? It's an herbicide, but it, it interacts with the, the, I think it's called the shikamati pathway of, of weeds, which also exists in bacteria. So spraying the ground with all these glyphosates is killing the Healthy biodiversity bacteria. of the soil. Yeah. And when you take foods that have glyphosate residues, it's potentially influencing the microbiome in your gut. So Organifi supplements are uh, glyphosate residue free. So they don't, they don't just say it's organic. It is, but they also test it on top of that to make sure there's no who's the, who's the leading researcher on that? Is that uh, Zach Bush? That's his field, right? Isn't that what he's not like? a leading researcher, but he talks a lot about it. That's he's, a, a, he's a doctor that talks a lot about it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was. I did that. I interviewed him a long time ago. Long right? time ago. That yeah. was a while. His ago. name came up though again. We were talking to somebody. Scared the hell out of me with that. <laughs> I know. It's like dude. it's coming from rain. It's like well, everywhere. what he, what was sad and unfortunate was he's like you know you're not even with organic food. He goes because yeah. of the because of the rain. It's I don't care if everything's all organic. You're still getting some of it. You know, yeah. it's impossible to not get. You know, any they of it. find those. They find some of these chemicals in breast milk, baby's urine, infants. Yeah, Dude, no. it's like the whole, it's everywhere. like it's everywhere. So like your goal now is just mitigation. Like, well, I'm going to be exposed to some, so let's just minimize. Let's bring that volume down. Yeah. yeah. Speaking yeah. of which, I did watch some of the Bill Maher interview on Rogan. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, I watched some of that too. I yeah. can see why he, it was a controversial. He said some stuff on there that I couldn't believe. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he made some mask comments. I was really surprised. Well, he really about. let his hair down. I, well, the, I enjoyed the, it. The part where yeah. he talked about doctors and science, he goes, you don't know what you're doing. He goes, yeah. you, you figured some stuff out, but you don't know what you're doing. Exactly. He's like, you still don't understand this. You don't understand They're that. They're human goes, beings at the end of the day, just like the rest of us. Yeah, like, you don't have answers he, for everything. He's like, we recall 100 or 1,000 drugs every year. Something like yeah. that. There's a number that's some crazy number. After they passed FDA trials, wasn't there a drug? Uh, what was it called? Was it? Uh, it was the it, it was an it was an arthritis drug. I can't remember it. Um, that uh, people were taking was causing heart issues. Then there was another oh, drug. Chantix. Oh, no, Chantix. Was one of them. Yeah, Chantix was an anti-smoking drug. So you take oh, it. Yeah, yeah, I heard this. And it prevents you from smoking. And why would you want to quit smoking? So that you lower your cancer risk. <laughs> oh, it, 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 it causes cancer. cancer oh wait, Chantix pathway. causes cancer. <laughs> Dude, you know. I know. 
That's, and yeah. it was on the market for like 10 or 15 years, right? Yeah. It was a long time. There's a lot of stuff like that. It'll be around for a long time. And then all of a sudden, oops, you know, we made, I mean, it's, I mean, it's understandable. We, you know, we got to try and figure this stuff out. But when they pretend like they know everything, no, you don't. Well, yeah. And, and just to not allow any kind of um, questions, really just questions like from general public or like other doctors that have a differing of opinion, having second opinions to like the first, because they need that. Yeah. They, they need that kind of counsel amongst, you know, the medical community, because it can't just be like, we're going to shut you off of conversation and we're right, just going right. to keep rolling with this idea, even though it's not working. Mm. Did you, do you, did you make it all the way through that interview? Yeah. You you finish most of Joe Rogan's, don't you? I do. Yeah. That's because of his drive. You're like yeah, the only. Per I got a longer drive than he does, and I don't finish. The, do you just, listen to him on the whole drive? No, I don't listen to him that often. But every once in a while, like like Bill Maher, I put it on there. But yeah. I just can't stay sucked in for three hours. It's you end up thinking about the stuff. I guess. Yeah. Or or what happens is I listen to it for the hour drive, and then I have don't want to come back. For oh, the, it's because the episodes are so long. That's true. Yeah, they're just they're just yeah. so long. I actually I take a lot of Joe Rogan stuff in by his clips. By his short little 12 or 13 minutes, like the title of it, I'm like, oh, yeah, I want to hear them talk. I want to hear Bill Maher and him talk about that. So yeah. I'll listen to the 13 minutes. I don't minute know. Clip. I think, it, yeah, it's kind of weird, but like he, he's his curiosity and the way that he thinks, like I'm very scatterbrained too. So, yeah. like, it, <laughs> I don't know. I get no, a lot I, out of I it. I appreciate his interview style. I know some yeah. people don't like it, but I like it. It's very, it's very similar to how we are, very conversationalist. Like, mm -hmm. I think that's how he is. So I, yeah. I enjoy it's it. It's the most relaxed. Well, I get interview. a lot out of that. Show. But you sometimes it's just that that relaxed. It's just really long. Yeah. There's, it's hard to stay with me or on, on the, I mean, shit, I could, you watch two of his interviews, could have finished a book. You yeah, know what I'm saying like well, <laughs> literally the same amount true. of same amount of time. That's why I have a hard Shoot, time. I could have a couple, uh, uh, you know, accolades behind my name uh, at this <laughs> yeah, point. Yeah, really. been, you have a PhD. Hey, have there. you have you been staying up on the uh, the winning the Lakers dynasty on HBO? Uh, such a great show. You haven't started watching it yet, have you, Sal? Mm -hmm. Even I got Doug on. You that. would like it, even though you you're would. not a big sports. Ball you know fan. what? I would. I would. I would probably like it. Uh, the problem is I don't have a lot of time uh, yeah, so, at the moment to watch I got it, you. but I would. <laughs> so, so the reason why I bring it up, okay, so did you see what Apple TV is doing in in, uh, in relation to that? No. Either one of you? No, I've just been watching it on HBO okay, Max. Okay, so guess what drops next? So I think the season finale for for that winning, I think, is coming up this weekend. Now, or, what, or what decades or what time frame is this on? Because there was this was when they Literally. were Johnson. Uh, oh, okay. it's all about Magic Johnson's yeah, story. Magic oh, Johnson. Yeah, yeah, it's all about his I mean, the Lakers, but I mean, pr the, his story. I his told era. you guys I had lunch with him. Once, right? was, no, I didn't know. Yeah, that. We, we, so remember when he worked um, with Magic Johnson? Yes, yeah, so remember yeah. he sponsored. He was yeah, he used uh, to be with Twenty Four Fitness. I've been around. I've been around oh, quite a few times. He used to be at all the all the events. Yeah, I won some. I was I was like the top sales guy or something like that. It was this huge. He's fucking giant. By the he's way, a, too. Yeah, oh, oh, I imagine. Oh yeah. yeah. I, oh, I mean, he's no. a guard, but you would think so. But when you, I met Bill Cartwright, right, and he was just like this huge. No, no, I shook his hand, it. and his his his, his, his yeah. fingers were like down to my forearm. Big dude. And he, because Masteroff, Mark Masteroff, this is when he was running the company. Yeah. He goes, Sal, come sit with us. So I was like, all right. So I sat next to Magic Johnson and he told stories the whole time and he yeah. was the most entertaining, charismatic, who's so fun. Had yeah. a great time with him. So you would, like so you cool would like it because it tells his whole backstory. Okay. But why I'm bringing this up, which I find it really, and I've seen this now two or three times. So they they finish the, the series. It's coming to the end. Apple Plus, okay, Apple TV is dropping Magic Johnson's four-part documentary. Oh. On the same thing. Piggybacking. So I see these, I'm starting to watch these streaming services play this game hmm. where somebody will do like the actual real documentary and then someone will do a dramatization. The other streaming service mm. will drop a dramatization of that same thing right afterwards. So like watch, like watch the super pump just finished. Watch somebody else drop like the actual real documentary to it. It's yeah. it's like, and I, I want, I would love to talk to, um, who's it? Mark who we had uh, from Netflix. I can't think of his last name right now. Randolph. 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 Yeah, Rand I would love to ask him about this. Like, That's a good strategy. If this is becoming like a new way they do these streaming wars is, okay, we'll let you go do that first. You test it. If it does really good, then, then we'll, we'll go jump on it. Yeah. Interesting. What was that conspiracy hmm. theory that you had about Magic, or uh, not you, but it was around Magic Johnson that he doesn't uh, really have HIV. He said that he does. I've heard Who said before. that? I didn't. I it was you. Me. No. Or was you? It was me. Okay. Yeah. Well, what, what, hold on. I'm not proud of this one. <laughs> Uh, no, no, that he that this this was a theory that. <laughs> hold on, I want to see if I remember. I want right. to hear this. Yeah, yeah. I definitely want to hear this. He doesn't really have HIV, but he said that so he had that to become no a public figure uh, because, like, the the theory was that he was like banging one of the um, executives' daughter uh, oh, from yeah. the league, and and then this was like they were using him to campaign towards HIV awareness or, or whatever. Okay. Like he, I, 
Again, not my personal. So the theory was that if he comes out and says, I have HIV, none of the women that he has been with will want to come out and say that they had affairs with him. Yes. Because then they would be, oh, nobody wants it. Now I was with the guy who has HIV. So, so it would prevent people from coming out to say that they had affairs with and him. And because he supposedly had an affair with like a major executive yes. within the- That uh, was the theory. <laughs> that was the theory. Well, the other one was- I mean, can it be can it be true though? The, think like, about it. Like, okay. Be, <laughs> I mean, it can be- conspiracy I mean, it doesn't have to be a conspiracy. I mean, it doesn't have to be a conspiracy. What if he really did have think HIV and that it. really did true. happen? Yeah. yeah. I mean, so that that's a that's believable. I'm sure he has, sure has HIV. Because his-, his Was I it mean, Charlie Sheen, right? Wasn't his- He started to do get Me too and then like uh, all of a sudden now he's got AIDS- um, no, did you guys ever? HIV. Did you guys ever read the uh, Charlie Sheen's Playboy interview? One of the best interviews I've ever read. Bro, if you haven't read that before, read it. He's the most. Uh, w that one interview he did on video where he said he had tiger's blood, and he was. I was like, wow, this guy's. I'm pretty I sure. I think he that's said, the move for cancel culture. You got to go super crazy. You yeah, know? you got to just like completely go like insane. And then there's nothing and they can say can't, about. What you. else are you gonna do? Yeah. They can't. They can't. Yeah. Do I mean, we we obviously give him a pass, and he's like one of the craziest. I, yeah, ever. I heard. I heard on a podcast some guy was like, "Oh, I was partying so hard," and he goes, "Now, how hard were you partying on a level like of Charlie zero Sheen? to Charlie Sheen?" <laughs> yeah, yeah. Charlie that, was Sheen all, was, that was the all Charlie, Charlie the Sheen or saying, Ozzy Osbourne. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, they were like, yeah. he was, I can't. Remember, oh no, was it? Uh, it was zero to Charlie. Nobody parties harder than Ozzy Osbourne. Yeah. No, you guys heard Charlie Sheen. My favorite story was uh, Nikki Six and Ozzy Osbourne yeah, on and tour. Together. On tour, which they're both known to be insane, right? Obviously, yes. Nikki passed away from. This is when they were to... snorting the ants and doing all kinds. Yeah, of stuff. And, yeah, yeah, and they were trying to out freak each other out. Yeah, yeah. And Ozzy Osbourne, like he, he not only freaked him out, he grossed everybody out so bad. Everybody's like, "I'm not gonna ever." You with? You yeah, with. I'm gonna leave this guy alone. That's it. Yeah, I, see, Charlie Sheen's not that type of like bite the bird's head off or snort ants. It was He's a bat. like, "I'm gonna." Yeah. Bang seventeen chicks in one yeah. night, type yeah. of dude. That's who he is, you know. Yeah. And do and do like hella lines of coke. Like that's more. Yeah. Charlie. How, how does he not die? Yeah. Hey, know. my theory is that these these Weeding. guys. I these, think all those drugs just kill all the everything, toxins, everything. Yeah, all of his potential yeah. cancer cells are dead. Yeah, he's been on. He's or been on you've chemo pushed forever. the limits like so Sparta. hard, your body's adapted. It's like it's yeah. so ready. Like you've pushed to death like so many times <laughs> that it's adapted to that. It's like it's gonna take so much this more. Is, he's just not, Spartan kicking all the rest of his cells in his body. This is like the argument for when people are like, no, you have a set date when you're supposed to die. I mean, look at these guys. Like, they didn't die because they're yeah. not supposed to die. Look at yeah. Keith Richards and the, dude, come on. How yeah. are these guys still alive? I don't understand it. <laughs> I know. And then I know nice people who die for no reason. Hey, yeah. so uh, more cool science stuff. So I was, uh, the other night, I was trying to find research on, because I was using Brain FM. And every time I, you know, I went for a little stint without using Brain FM and then I used it again and it always blows me away at how effective it is. Like, the focus, uh, you know, songs, or I don't know what you call them, the beats or whatever, literally about eight to 10 minutes in, it feels like a focus drug. I could feel myself totally focused on whatever I'm doing. Yeah. So I was trying to look up research on sounds and how they affect the brain. And the best I could find were some research on binaural beats, which is not Brain FM. Brain FM technology is like a, a level up. Yeah. From by actually beats. write music uh, with Brain FM. It's just a whole nother level, and there's yeah. a lot of research. Actually, we're not supposed, to, we're not able to disclose, but but Brain FM is doing a lot of research on their, you know, how they do their stuff and how it affects the brain and affects focus and affects sleep and all that stuff. It's really fascinating stuff. But anyway, binaural beats, which is a step down, is still very interesting. There's this study on kids that use these binaural beats to achieve, um, like, get high. So like they'll design these these sounds and they'll put on these really like big headphones and they'll go in a dark room and they'll report that they get either psychedelic effects oh, wow. or some of them will feel like they're they're on speed or depending on the sounds and the beats and apparently it's getting really popular in Latin American countries and now in the U.S. more and more kids are using them. Did really you guys ever do that at uh, uh, Paleo Effects? I believe where yeah the. Oh yeah, but it was lights and it was like yeah yeah that was weird and, dude like, yeah and so you're like like laying in this chair and you start to see all these fractional geometric patterns and then like it's like these crazy music to go with it I was tripping a little bit I'll be honest yeah yeah it was weird yeah that was really weird. I don't know well Brain FM always trips me out every time I use it if I use the meditation have you ever meditated with the meditation sounds. No, I, I honestly, I'd use focus the most and then sleep occasionally, but 
I have to try the. I've done the. I've done the guided and the unguided one on there. That yeah. is. Trick, I mean, dude. I love their 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 product. Like you know what I was late to the party was the focus part. Yeah, Justin used to you, always you, do that. You, yeah, but you figured out how to use it for sex. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you remember that right? Yeah, that was a little hack, dude. A good little yeah, hack. it did. It it did work for that. It was incredible. In fact, we should do that in a while. I think it's been a long time since I've done that. That was uh, actually. You're welcome. Yeah, incredible. <laughs> so, there you go, Katrina. No, I, they're they're still texting me right now. Adding stability ball. No, their their product is legit, and we haven't talked about it on the show in a really long time and it's been one of those things that i mean we've been working with them for a very long time mm -hmm. and co consistently i use it even if i haven't used it for a while i'll eventually go back to it for something whether it be me trying to study or do something or write or do something well, creative people who are skeptical go to sleep. people who are skeptical about kind of stuff like this you know because I, I can be very skeptical initially but then i have to question like wait a minute it's obvious music has an effect on your emotions and your state of mind mm -hmm. nobody would argue that right nobody like I, there's certain songs that can invoke a feeling in me. Of course. Um, even the first time I heard them, and some I can hear them repeatedly will do well, there's that. There's a reason every single movie has it, uh, music. Disney hacked this a long time ago. Yeah. yeah. They hacked this a they long time. They make you feel something. Like, yeah. You're scared, happy, yeah. sad, whatever. Like they have a literal way to like evoke that. Oh. Haven't you seen those examples before where they'll show like a movie like that that has like this crazy like cinematic like music behind it? Like an and they take the music out. And they take yeah. it out. It like kills it. Totally. Yeah, it don't even give you the same feeling at all watching no, it. No, yeah. and, and also uh, before- they put careless whisper on there instead. Yeah. And you're <laughs> yeah. just like, oh, Be before we learned how to record our thoughts with writing, the way we would pass information was through song because yeah. our memory is significantly better when it's tied to music. Like, well, like right now, if you were to say the ABCs, you would sing it. That's how you learned it, and that's how why you'll never forget it. Really I told you guys about that with yeah. my. So I have a, my cousin who has five kids, and she's home. She came from a homeschool family. She homeschools, and the kids are all like geniuses. And one of the things that the that the way they've taught them since they were tiny is through song, and they build on the songs as they age. So they start with something su super remedial, real basic for them to start off. That's very easy when they're you know. Mm -hmm toddlers or whatever and then they add a little bit then add a little bit until it turns into this like massive song where they're teaching history and science and everything built into it. it's wild oh, i'd love wow. it and they're and school like it, that they could just go it's like, crazy brilliant. it's crazy how smart these kids there's all of them are i mean they're some of them are teenagers now but a, a lot of them are like you know eight nine years old and stuff in that age range and they'll be watching like the history channel and be able to like quote all these like random facts about because something. of the songs yes yeah. it's weird yeah that we're, we evolve that way for some reason right yeah. you see you mentioned disney earlier did you see that police officers are playing disney theme songs and music when they're pulling people over and doing like uh like when they're you know, <laughs> for copyright issues that the way the cops can't. are doing that yes no they're not uh, yes they are yeah. no they're not yes they are that way people can't share the videos Remember when on you brought that up about like uh, you should make your sex tape yeah. that so yeah. that we could share yeah. it you play disney because, because what happens the, the most litigious or what well because if a cop pulls someone over uh oh risk instant arrest or whatever and there's like disney's music in the background if you post it to youtube it picks up, Shut the, up the Disney music. I did not see that. And it that. takes it off immediately. That's brilliant. I literally read an article in, on Reason Magazine about this. Wow. Cops are figuring out a way. <laughs> I know. Isn't that funny? That is Can fun. we build a snowman? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're getting beat. <laughs> fucked up, man. <laughs> <laughs> ah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not happy about this. <laughs> <laughs> like, they're waiting that, because it's like 15 seconds, I think, right? So yeah. you got to wait that 15 seconds before you can do yeah. anything like hey, that. Hey, I'm just Hold pulling on. it One? over right now. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, alarm goes off. <laughs> yeah, bing, bing. Yeah. Bing. yeah. <laughs> 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 anyway. Hey, so Near Disney, far. Disney's crashing, right? Oh, the stock yeah. is tanking right now. Yeah, bad. Dude. I knew it. Yeah, I knew that would happen. I don't even like, don't even like checking that right now, bro. They should have. They should have kept their mouth <laughs> shut. Yeah. So, do you, what do you think is going to happen, though? I don't think. I, I think that. I think they'll respond. I think that. I think they initially put if that smart. They will. They I will. think that money is a very powerful motivator for you, a company. Yeah, I and think so, so you lose money, you, you change your direction real quick. I think so. Well, I, it's think a that, bummer I, I think that you didn't read the crowd well there. <laughs> yeah, it's a bummer because they got all these new shows coming out I want to check out. But it's like, you know, like I, I don't want to support whatever the hell they're doing they, over there. Which one of you, one of you two, told the amount of subscribers they lost, it was a They lost a ton. A yeah. huge number, yeah, right? Yeah, they did. Yeah, you, you, it's, it's, it's stupid. I've said this before. If you're a big corporation, especially one that's been around for a long time, don't take positions on things because 100% you did something in the past that's going to counter that. And then people are smart. They'll look it up or do something you're doing now will make you look like a massive hypocrite. 
So it's just you're better off keeping your mouth. I think that's I I think because it's become it's so polarizing that I think that that's going to be the future of companies is to stay out. Yeah, I think more like and that's more. their policy. Yeah, we'll yeah you saw who, who came out and did that Coinbase and a couple other ones said no politics in the, in the smart. In the, yeah, just I think that's going to become a thing in the in the future mm-hmm. is like because taking a side Dude, like that right now. I remember when I was dangerous. at the bar, it was like you don't talk about politics, you don't talk about religion, talk about money. Yeah. That was the rules. Yeah, and it was great. Yeah. yeah. Everybody was cool. Yeah, and everybody has to talk about those things. All, yeah. Well, maybe not no all more. of them, just the, yeah. just the politics part. Yeah, you're dumb. You're, unless you're perfect, you should probably shut your mouth is what I would say. Yeah. Hey, real quick, I got to talk to you about one of our sponsors, Live On. Now, one of my favorite supplements that they make is their liposomal glutathione. Here's the problem with glutathione. Nine out of 10 times when you consume it, it doesn't get to your system. It gets destroyed by the gut, but not with Live On's proprietary delivery system. Okay, It actually does get absorbed. Now, why is that a good thing? Well, glutathione is the master antioxidant. So when you increase your levels of glutathione, you fight off infections, you recover better, your skin health improves. And here's my my favorite part, better strength and muscle gains as proven by studies. Now, LiveOn also makes other supplements with this proprietary delivery system. They have a B complex, they have a vitamin C uh, uh, supplement. They also have other stuff. You got to go check them out. It's medical-based delivery system. So most supplements... You just pee them out, but not with Live On Labs. And by the way, right now, you get free liposomal glutathione when you bundle their B-complex with their vitamin C supplement. So it's a huge savings. Go check these guys out. $75 savings, by the way. Head over to the mindpumppartners.com page, click on Live On Labs, and check out their stuff. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Bergen from South Carolina. Hey, Bergen, how can we help you? Hi guys. Um, so I'm super nervous. Um, but I wanted to thank you guys first for, you know, doing everything that you do, putting all the free content out that you do. Um, it's changed my life. Um, I know you've helped a lot of other people too. Um, and I wanted to thank you too, for finally creating map symmetry. Um, I broke my leg two years ago and haven't been able to, um, balance out my lower body ever since. So I'm on finishing up week one and it's already such a good program. So hell awesome. yeah. Thanks, wow. Guys. Awesome. Hell yeah. <laughs> so glad. We'll send you that 50 bucks for that plug later on. <laughs> <laughs> Great commercial. I appreciate um, it. so anyways, um, my question, it's a little bit long winded. Um, I started out as a trainer in 2013 in, um, big box gyms made a career change to a desk job in um, 2018 and then realized how much I missed training. So thanks to you guys, I found NCI. So I'm going through um, level one and a bunch of other of their certifications. Um, One of the most pivotal things that they talked about for me in the certification was um, the idea of periodizing diets for clients. Um, so they put it in terms of in-season, post-season, off-season, and pre-season. Um, so, you know, in-season for a typical weight loss client is going to be like the actual cut phase, um, you know, going for whatever their goal is. Off-season is going to be reverse dieting, returning to homeostasis, focusing on biofeedback. Um, so my ideal clients for the business that I'm building is females with a history of yo-yo diets that have like tried everything and haven't had success, um, maybe have some hormone imbalances, cortisol issues, things like that. So my question for you guys um, is how would you take that um, periodization seasons idea um, on the training side? So like take an average, you know, maybe 40 year old client, female client that's been chronically dieting. She's not in a place where she should take on a diet. Um, So how would you take that client from off season to, you know, the diet phase on the training side? I like this question. That's a really good question. I like this question. Bergen, by the way, did we see you at the, uh, the coaching con? Were you there? No, I was not. I really wish I could have gone. Okay, no Next problem. One. Next. So, one. all right. So, look. So, so this is a, a good example of uh, this is a common mistake a lot of coaches and trainers make when they start to learn new information. Is what we tend to do is we tend to overcomplicate things and try to apply that information in areas where they don't necessarily need to be applied, um, or in ways that might be um, maybe not as beneficial. So, let me explain what I'm talking about. So, what you mean with the nutrition or how they're breaking up nutrition? very beneficial, makes tons of sense. That's how I would work with someone's diet. It's perfect. Now with workouts and the way we wrote our workouts, 
is totally different. Now we phase the workouts based off of the, the body's ability to adapt and the programs themselves are specifically designed for a target type of goal or adaptation that we're looking for. So, you know, MAP starter would be really good for a total beginner, for example. MAPS resistance, maybe somebody who's a little bit more advanced, who has some a uh, little bit of experience with barbells and dumbbells. MAPS anabolic further, right? Great for strength, but very much stuck in a in one plane of movement, but very good for strength and metabolism building performance. Obviously, more mobility and movement focus, but also great for strength and muscle building and then so on, right? Aesthetic, more bodybuilding, more volume, that kind of stuff. So really what you want to do, Bergen, is you want to pick the program that works best for the client's goals and their workout history and their current fitness levels. Now, from there, as a trainer or coach, this is the beauty of being a great trainer or coach, is you can modify it to suit the client even better. Because as much as we try to make the programs as uh, applicable as possible for the people that we design them for, we're still writing them for a general audience. So what I would do is I would take, you know, let's say you took your client and they're, you know, somewhat experienced, or maybe they worked out a couple years ago. They're not really working out now. You want to speed up their metabolism, you know, so you want to build muscle and strength. You're going to, MAPS Anabolic would be a great addition, but within MAPS Anabolic, I can look at the program and say, okay, I can go two foundational workouts a week, or I can go three foundational workouts a week, or I can go one and bring it back from there. So that's how I would use the programs. I wouldn't look at the programs specifically as preseason, off-season, off season, postseason, you know, type of goals. It doesn't really work that way. In fact, if you look at MAPS performance, MAPS performance itself it looks like how you would train a client from off-season to, you know, to getting yeah. right before they to get peaking into right before season. Yeah, yeah, but but really don't apply the nutrition what you learn with nutrition in this context to the programs specifically because it doesn't it won't work that way. Now that being said, there there are some things though that I think she should look out for. Like so, so say for example, you allow a client to drive your decision on what program because they say I just want to look a certain way. So you you put them in something like you know anabolic or aesthetic, and then they go to split, and they be and they become very focused like bodybuilding type of programs because they care about how they look the most. And so you as a coach, you start pick you keep picking all these maps programs that are focused around, but then you neglect to do things in different planes, like the, which performance and symmetry provides. Right. So I, I do think that there is, there, there's some, some like mild rules that you would want to kind of follow as a coach. If you found yourself doing like anabolic aesthetic split, all like back to back. And then you have a client who's complaining of like joint pain or, or even just, uh, chronic pain because they're maybe the volume of training is too much for them. So there are some things like that where you, you as a coach have to be able to pay attention to that and go, Oh, that's because we're neglecting, you know, unilateral work or we're neglecting other planes of motion. And so I need to incorporate performance or symmetry, even though this person's goal is build more muscle, build more muscle. So I do think that uh, you, you got to pay attention to that. Now we, we don't talk about this a lot on the show. We did early on, we wrote the programs in a specific order. If you follow that order, uh, no matter what you're doing diet wise, so that you're going to be fine. Because we we took that into account, like that. No matter what your goal is, everybody at one point should run through performance. So if you go anabolic performance aesthetic and you cycle through that, say every year, you don't allow yourself to completely neglect that, you'll be fine. So I think there's there are some yeah. things. It's not, but it's not as uh, cut and dry as like dieting where it's off season on season reverse dieting like that yeah speaking to the to the training side of it too and it wasn't mentioned in any of our prime programs in here but the the prime compass test is something that's very valuable for coaches to always take into account like if you're transitioning from one program to the other or before you start the program yeah. really what you're working with like what kind of uh, imbalances are there dysfunction any kind of uh uh loss of connection. Uh, and, and that way you can make those decisions in terms of like, um, you know, what you can focus on, whether that's unilateral work, uh, you know, whether we need to, to work on multiple planes of motion, um, or if it's, if it's pretty, pretty straightforward, we can kind of get, get after it and just work on muscle building. Like that's, that's something I'm always actually cycling back in to, to retest. So even like, sometimes I'll take it in for like every month we get through a training cycle and uh, I, I want to see what what the body looks like after that. So that's just something to consider. Yeah, and, and I'm going to simplify this. I'm going to make it real simple for you, Bergen. 
can you go, can you be on a diet where you're cutting and run MAPS anabolic? Yes. No. Can you be on a diet where you're reverse dieting and be on an anabolic? Yes. Can you be on a bulking diet, you know, diet and run MAPS anabolic? Yes. Can you be on a diet where you're trying to work on your gut health and follow MAPS anabolic? Yes. This is true for all the programs. All the programs, any kind of diet will be appropriate so long as the context is appropriate, so long as the program is appropriate uh, for the client. It really doesn't matter if you're cutting, if you're building, if you're reverse dieting, if you're maintaining. The program is the program. So what you what, what a lot of people get confused with is they think, here's my cutting program, here's my yeah. bulking program, here's my... And really, the reason why people see value in doing that, because you'll talk to people who do that, and they oh, but it works. Every time I do that, it works. You know what worked? Is that you changed something. Yeah, or you're, like, or you're consistent. I could go, <laughs> I, look, classically, just to give you an example, right? Classically, uh, bodybuilders would say that supersets and giant sets and short rest periods are better for cutting because the, the, the thought was, well, you're burning more calories. So I can see where the rationale comes from. But- Honestly, your body adapts really fast to that. Just like it adapts to any kind of resistance training program, or any kind of workout, uh, uh, regardless. Can you do a strength building uh, type program where you rest three minutes and do a cut? Yeah. In fact, yeah. if that's what's different for your body, if that's what's novel, that's better <clears throat> than going with the you know idea that you got to do supersets and all this other stuff. So look at the workout like this. What workout is best for my client's goals and their history? And then the diet you can apply and it doesn't matter what diet you do. And of course, modify the workout, whether or not it's working, if it's too much volume or too little volume for that individual. Diet can affect those things, but that's where you observe as a coach and say, well, all right, we're, we're cutting calories. MAPS aesthetic is really high volume anyway. And now it looks like it's too much volume because the calories are so low. So now we're going to re reduce the volume a little bit. Does that all make sense to you? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's really helpful. It's helpful for my own personal programming too. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Very, Excellent. very cool. Yeah, very cool. No, I, I, thanks for calling in, Bergen. And you know what? Because you're a trainer, I, I'd like to give you something. Do yeah, you what have, are you missing? Are you missing any of our program? Any program in particular you really like uh, like to have access to? I mean, I used to be a competitive power lifter and I don't have power lift. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you Hell go. Yeah. We're going to send you a 5% off coup coupon. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We'll send, we'll send you mass power lift right now, okay? Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. No this problem. This is really cool. Thanks for calling in. I like that question. Yeah, what a common like uh, yeah, because mistake, we, right? We well, we get, um, and I'm glad you you addressed the way you did and made it simple because it's probably one of the most common questions that I get is like, how assume, do I eat in phase two? Yes, how someone buys a program and they go, well, why don't we have paired meal plans? Yeah, to go with our right. Programs? Should I bulk on this? Should I, you know, and it, what it is is people just want to, they want to be told what to they do. Want to simplify. It. But the truth is, uh, you said it perfect. Is that there's tremendous value in running anabolic in all the different ways of dieting. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and that goes true for every program. Yep. And so, have you ever cut like like Have you ever cut on a on a straight up strength program? Yes, I mean that's how I got shredded. I've for done all the all the above. Yeah. And there's and you, there's like science there's muscle preserving a factor to that. It doesn't. I mean, I've I've done I've done the the yeah. high volume superset giant sets when I'm bulking too. It's, yeah. it, it doesn't. This whole pairing thing that we try to rationalize, really it's more about like does it work? Is it novel? And well, is it what and your body needs. You yeah. can pull science to support all of them. So right. and I think that I think the most important thing to, to and you addressed it also is the novelty. If you always run supersets, at, you know, during, you know, the year and you're getting ready to go into cut, well, supersetting in that cut is not a great idea because yeah. you've been doing it. And what would be great is a, is a anabolic type program, five yeah. by five strength with long rest periods. Right. Right. So because right. it's novel, right. Because you haven't been doing that. So I think that's the, the big takeaway with this, yeah. but we do get this question a lot. And then one, one thing to add to that, uh, that I didn't even tell her, it just dawned on me. Also consider your psychology when you're training, when yeah. you're switching your training program. There, I definitely will lean towards, now I've done strength during a cut, okay? And it was really effective because it was novel. But I definitely lean towards shorter rest periods and supersets when I'm cutting, but it's not because that's a superior way to work out No, you don't want to feel like a wuss because yeah. you know how strong you are yeah, when you're I'm, calorie. I got to go lighter anyway, yeah, right? So, yeah. I, I'm, and if I'm cutting my calories and I'm trying to lift, you know, heavy and I'm watching the numbers go down, it messes with me psychologically. Totally. I, so that's something else to consider. I agree. Our next caller is... Uh, Skylar and JoLynn from Nebraska. Hey, you two. How can we help you? Hey, guys. It's nice to talk to you today. We're super excited. Awesome. All right. Um, so, like I said, we're uh, Skylar and JoLynn here. Skylar's my workout partner. Um, so, we're super excited to talk to you today. Um, Skylar's working to get her, her, um, certified, her personal training certification and your guys' podcast, what she's learned there. 
um, and working through the programs is really kind of what inspired her to uh, pursue that. So thank you for doing what you guys do. You really make a difference. So we appreciate you. Thank you. Very cool. Um, so I'm 48 and my daughter is 21. Like I said, she's my workout partner. She uh, pushes me to lift more than I ever would imagine that I could and doesn't let me uh, slack because I'm an old lady. So <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, we run anabolic once and aesthetic twice. Uh, we just started performance. We were going to start split, but after listening to a podcast where Sal was very strongly recommending uh, performance instead of split, we put split on the back burner. And now we're starting performance. So, um, good choice. We uh, feel like we're on the right path as far as our workout goes. But one thing that we've been kind of focusing on, especially in the last phase of aesthetic was our um, intake and um, with our calories and protein. Um, we really struggle to get like 1500 to 1700 calories in a day and to be in a surplus and then getting a hundred grams of protein in a day is tough. And it's mostly just because, you know, we're not hungry. So um, my question was, do you guys have any tips on how we can get, you know, more protein and calories in do we just you know kind of shut up and eat more or um <laughs> uh, change our mindset That's usually my advice. Advice. i was gonna say how would you respond if we gave that uh, shut up and eat more yeah. <laughs> next question shut up and eat more okay yeah. simple now you know I'm, I, that's a that's a not a very common question but it's not it's, also not super uncommon that's right i'm so glad actually they're asking this because uh, you know, we say it on the podcast, but for some reason, I don't know why people don't admit it more often because I've, we've Especially all, the protein. That's, yes. That's, that's, we've trained enough female clients to know that a majority of them miss protein intake. Uh, most all of them do. And, yeah. and it's such a game changer when you, when you hit those targets consistently, especially when you're following a good training program. If you guys consistently hit your protein and calorie intake, you're going to see muscle come on the body, lean out, tighten up really quick if you can be consistent with yeah. that. So there's three three things I'm going to say here and um, that I think can help. Um, one is sometimes if the volume of the training is too high, okay, and I'm saying this because you both did aesthetic, and aesthetic's a lot of volume, and I, I want people to know this. Like, I've been working out for years. I know I'm 43, but I've been training for a long time, and aesthetic is usually too much volume for me, okay? It's not always, but usually. And what happens often when volume is – a little bit too high or maybe even a lot too high, especially a lot too high for people, is their appetite actually decreases. It's actually, it can be a sign of overtraining. And as this appetite decreases, cravings go up for other types of maybe quote unquote unhealthy foods. So pay attention to the following things. Are Is your sleep disrupted? Are you noticing any um, intolerances to hot and cold? Do you feel more sore than you normally do? Has this, the weight on the bar, the dumbbells, has it plateaued? Your, your, your volume may be a little too high, and sometimes when you drop the volume, then the muscle building signal is louder because now the body has more room to adapt. It's not just worried about recovering, and then the appetite goes up. Now, that might not be happening with you, uh, but I'm just throwing that out there, so that's something you might want to ask yourself. The second thing is if this isn't the issue, um, then I would also look at other aspects of your life that may be contributing to your appetite going down. Are you getting good sleep? Do you feel like you're otherwise active besides the resistance training workouts? Are you guys walking? That kind of stuff. So that's something else to pay attention. And then here's the third thing. Let's say everything's good. You're feeling strong. It's a good amount of volume. You guys are doing everything right. But man, it's really hard to eat the amount of calories I, I think I should be eating uh, to hit my goals. Well, one, we don't want to create a dysfunctional relationship by stuffing yourself or force feeding yourself. That's dysfunctional just like restricting uh, would be with somebody where they're just constantly trying to re restrict themselves. So don't do that, but rather maybe seek out foods that are a little bit more palatable, right? So chicken breasts, kind of hard to eat when you're eating, you know, trying to hit a certain amount of calories. You know, flank steak or ground beef. Or chicken thighs. Or chicken thighs may be a little bit easier, right? So look for things that are a little bit more hyper palatable and then here's also where protein shakes can be quite valuable. And in, in some cases, person finishes the day, they're like, oh, I ate, you know, 80 grams of protein or 70 grams of protein. I'm not really hungry enough to eat a full meal, but a 30 gram protein shake, not a big deal. Now I can have that shake and hit those, those protein targets. 
So those are the three the three places that I would look. I think with perform how how far along are you in performance, by the way? This is our third day. Only the yeah. third day. I would yeah. be surprised if your appetite didn't go up by the second or third week because aesthetic is so much volume. Performance is more of an appropriate level of volume, especially phase one for people that that what we often see is a, a healthy increase in appetite because that stimulus is a little more appropriate. So I'd be interested to see if your appetite changes by the second or third week. But if it doesn't, the shake or choosing things that are a little bit more palatable, this is where you could seek foods out that you enjoy eating more that can help with the increased calories. I'm going to give you a, a, a generic uh, piece of advice that has helped a lot of people in this the same boat as you guys are in. Um, what I've found, it's really hard, and I've struggled with this personally too, not just with clients. It's really hard if you get to noon or one and you are way behind on protein already. Then you're mm -hmm. trying to feel, you're trying to feel like you're you're trying to catch up all day and all night. So staying on top of the the protein intake early uh, and consistently helps a lot. Now, why that's so challenging is breakfast foods generally aren't high protein. Most breakfast foods are high carb. So one of the things that's worked wonders for me is that whatever it is that you have for dinner, normally everybody has a, not everybody, but normally clients that are listening to this podcast are, you know, eating a meat based type of, you know, dinner. And what I'll do is I will cook more than what we need for dinner. So I have whatever that meat is, and it could be chicken, ground beef, turkey, you know, steak, and I'm going to carve off at least four to six ounces of that to the side for my breakfast the next morning. And then I'm going to scramble eggs and cheese with that. And that is like a 40 gram, 50 gram, uh, breakfast. That's protein rich. Um, that's a huge when you're trying to hit a hundred grams to already get out the gates with, you know, 40, 50 grams to yeah, start. So that's like a, that's almost half. Yeah. So, and, and then the, the other thing that I noticed, and I, I've talked about this on the podcast a couple of times that I thought was really interesting. The guys and I, in fact, it was just a couple of weeks ago. I remember when I used to start my mornings really early and when I was trying to increase my calories, I found that if I got up early and I had something light, like a, a bowl of oatmeal with you know blueberries and strawberries and a scoop of whey protein, I found I was hungrier again like two hours later. It would just like kickstart my metabolism. It felt like all of a sudden I wanted to eat again. And then that second meal would be like the meal I'm telling you right now. So those are two little hacks that are generic pieces of advice um, that I, because I don't obviously have all the details about what you guys are currently doing that I've seen help a lot of people. So if you if you haven't tried that already, um, I, I would implore you to try that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I think I, I personally, I wait until like 10 o'clock before I even oh, yeah. start eating. And I, that's just because I'm not hungry. So I, that's, that's a good tip to maybe start with something smaller in the early in the morning. Um, so if we're not getting, if we're kind of struggling uh, during the day to get, you know, like maybe to 1500 to 1700 calories in our protein, do you guys think there's one that we should maybe shoot for more than the other? Like, should we kind of focus on getting our protein for the day? Protein. Okay. Protein. Yeah, protein. yeah, I would hit the pro. I would. I would aim yeah. for the protein. But yes. I mean, you know, if you don't mind me asking, what what bot what are your guys's body weights? Because that'll also give me a better idea of of what the protein. You know, the range of protein targets. Uh, we're both. What are you? I'd say like one forty five. I don't weigh myself regularly okay. though. Yeah, I'm about there too. Okay. Forty one forty five. Yeah, hundred grams is is about is about right. I hundred grams is good. So I think you guys are on right on track. And, okay. and, and again, look in the morning, you know, if you, if you don't eat till 10, have a 40 gram protein shake, right? When you wake up really yeah. easy to okay. digest, there's 40 grams gone right there. And it probably won't affect your appetite in negatively in the context of what we're talking about uh, too much. And you get your 40 grams right there and you could just, you know, shake it in a shaker yeah. cup. And as soon as you wake up and boom, there's your 40 grams and you, you could take that off your, off your total. Yeah. If you have a hard time doing the advice I said about you know, the meat and the eggs and cheese all because that just sounds heavy and a lot to you do what just Sal said, or do the oatmeal and whey thing that I was talking about as early as you can. Right. When you wake uh, up and, and then that will help you uh, get to that second meal. Yeah. Now what I said about <coughs> over, what I said about overtraining, does any mm -hmm. of that resonate with you? And let me explain why I said this to you. Okay. This is why, and I'm guessing based off of my experience, I could totally be wrong, but you have a daughter that's becoming a personal trainer and nine out of 10 times when someone's becoming a trainer, they over train themselves and they over train them clients. It's, it's exciting. It's fun. 
you're also young and you get away with overtraining differently than you will when you're a little older. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing is the comment that you made in the in the question that she doesn't let you go light or slack. <laughs> uh, and that that could be, you know, maybe you like to slack a lot. Maybe you don't want to work out. And so she's like, come on, let's go do it. Or maybe you're just, you're, you're pushing, you're redlining too often with the workouts, you know? If, yeah. you know, if hard is good, harder is not better. You know, a certain amount of volume is good. More volume is not necessarily better. And I can't stress this enough, especially when we're excited and we have goals and we're motivated, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're probably going to err the side of, of too much. So, so yeah. I, I really, I, I'm going to guess that by week two or three in MAPS performance, you're going to see a, a more healthy increase uh, in appetite. When I say healthy increase, there's a difference between cravings and appetite. Um, when mm -hmm. I'm, my body wants to build muscle in a, in a good way. I, I want to eat whole natural foods. When I'm overtrained, I want junk food. I want, you know, things that increase my serotonin and dopamine to help me feel better because I'm overtrained. So it's a different yeah. kind of feeling. So I'd be surprised again, if by two or three weeks nap from now, if you don't start to notice an increase, especially going from aesthetic, a, a kind of healthy increase uh, in appetite. Well, in aesthetic too, I really struggled with my squat. I couldn't get more than a plate on there. So how long were you stuck at that way for? Oh, like I think all of phase three. Yeah. Well, phase three is gnarly. And, and again, I want to make this point again, because I know a lot of people like maps aesthetic because of the name. It's, it's a lot of volume. It's probably too much for yeah. most people. So uh, let's see how you guys feel after mass performance, especially awesome. after phase one. I and think I really think the the protein is going to make a big difference to course. being consistent with that because because hundred a hundred is already on the kind of lower end. You could definitely go all the way up. I mean, to you can go up to one hundred and forty. Yeah, want. so you're already on, if and if you have a hard time missing the lower end, I mean, your body's just uh, you're training, sending the signal to build muscle, but you're not giving it the building blocks to do it. So right. which which will also explain why you get stuck. You had a certain you know you've built a lot of strength for your size and the diet that you're eating right now, and you're doing great. And the body's wanting yeah. to grow and build more muscle, but you're not giving it the the nutrients that it needs. You be mm -hmm. consistent with that, uh, and I think you're going to see. Yeah. I think you're going to see a difference. Now, now, uh, I also want to commend you guys on, on both of you on working out together. I think this is phenomenal. What a wonderful experience to have mother daughter um, to go through because exercise and, and working out, especially resistance training. Yeah, good job, it's such mom. Such a growth minded. Thank you. No, I got her into it. No. <laughs> hey, it's it's great. I'm sure I'm sure you guys value the time aside from the workout. Right? Yeah, but you just so you know, a lot of, a lot of parents wouldn't have joined. You know, I know a lot of young a young training kids that want to get their mom or dad to live with and them. They and, no. and they say that's, no. That's so, most of the time. Yeah. But what I said about the overtraining, does that resonate at all or am I, am I off base? Are you guys pretty, pretty. Oh, yeah. No, yeah, it does. Okay. All right. Well, let's yeah. see. Let's see how you feel after mass performance. Okay. All right. Thanks, guys. No yep. problem. Hey, good luck with your your personal training certification. I, I, who's Thank which you. one's the daughter? Is it Skylar or Jolyn? Skylar. Skylar. Good luck yeah. with that. Okay. Thank you. you, you got Thanks, it. guys. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I, I I would guess. I, you know, the thing about questions, you know, when we answer them like this, it's it, you have to guess a little of bit. Of course, of course. But I mean, you know, my daughter doesn't let me slack. She doesn't let me go light. Yeah. New trainer, maps aesthetic twice. It's hard to eat more food. I'm like, uh, you're probably overtrained. That's what I feel like. Well, I, and it, and it's uh, like a feedback loop too, right? You're overtraining and you're under consuming on the protein. Yep. And so talk about it just a heart goes down. And yeah, the protein helps you recover. I I really like. Uh, I mean, I was going to chime in, but it was really the same advice you gave Adam. It was really just what I noticed, especially with my uh, the kids that I train and myself, even personally. The earlier I eat, yeah. the better. And it's just like it just starts you on such a better path. To get those calories in, and then yes, it might not be. I'm not hungry. It doesn't matter. Yeah, like you got to. Even if it's a small amount of calories, it's better to just start kind of you know uh, training your body to get used to that. I had to start with, and I know it wasn't the best choice. This is me at like 22 years old or with that, like a yo play yogurt because I had no appetite in the morning, but I recognized that I had to get had to get it going. You picked the manliest thing to eat. Too in the <laughs> do, you remember, do you remember those? Do they make those anymore? The the yeah. yo play whips. I, yes. I uh, love those things, yeah. right? So that, but I mean, uh, it, it, was, it was it was so <laughs> <laughs> it was so light that um, even if I wasn't hungry yet, it was enough. And I to, bet it got you hungry. It did. Yeah. I would do it when the first thing when I wake up when I was training five o'clock in the morning. At five o'clock in the morning, I did not want to eat a egg, steak, you know, yeah. rice and cheese type yeah. of meal. But I could I could drill that, and then all of a sudden, I, in an hour or two, I would want to eat again, and then I'd have that big, you know, egg and steak yeah. and rice type of breakfast. Our next caller is Dylan from Minnesota. 
Dylan, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey guys, thanks for having me on. Um, my question is about app development. Um, I've been working out now for about six years consistently. Um, and you know, I've done a number of bulks and cuts in that time. And even when I've been down to my leanest, uh, which is around 155 pounds, um, I'm five foot nine. I've always had trouble really getting the, the big blocky visible abs. Um, they you know, it just seem kind of washed out and not really there unless I'm kind of twisting to the side and crunching down on them. Okay, so so you're. Uh, by the way, where are you calling? Are you on Mars right now? Where are you calling? <laughs> he's from? in a tunnel. I think he's under water. Yeah. Maybe. No. Um. Okay. So the question is, you want your abs to be more visible. You want them bigger and blockier, right? Yeah. Okay. You you, you got to build them. You, you know, abs are muscles, just like your biceps and your pecs and your lats and your quads. And for some reason, the way we tend to approach ab training is totally different. Like all of the muscle building principles that apply to the body all of a sudden go out the window. Isn't and that funny? We train abs. It's like 5,000 reps. I, we're all guilty of this too yeah. at one point in our lives, right? It's always why, high reps. Why yeah. is that? Who, I, who know, started that bullshit? I, you know, it, it was a old school bodybuilders. Yeah, yeah, it was old school bodybuilders really. And they would, like Arnold was known for doing, he would get on the Roman chair and do sit-ups for 30 minutes straight. Yeah. And that's what he did. And the, re the reality is that that high of reps isn't going to build uh, muscle, just like it wouldn't build your biceps or your quads that much. So what you want to do is you want to train them like you're trying to build them. So this means high tension, high resistance, and your reps around 8 to 12. Now, high tension and high resistance is all relative. So what I don't want people to do, and this is where I'll, I'll add a little caution, is where people will add tons of resistance to an ab exercise and then their form goes out the window. Because to really train the abs properly through a full range of motion, remember the, the function of the abs, think of it this way, right? So the bottom of the abs attach at the pelvis and the top of the abs attach at the rib cage. And when the muscles contract, they bring the rib cage to the pelvis. So they literally round the lower back, okay? What they don't do is bend you at the hips. Bending you at the hips is your glutes, and your hamstrings uh, or your hip flexors, right? So either you're extending or you're flexing. But what you want is you want to bend at the lower back. You want to roll yourself up. So that's the motion and do it with a lot of tension and resistance. So that may mean just reverse crunches on a bench. It may mean maybe you're really strong. So you could do decline sit-ups really well or leg raises really well where you really tuck the, the tailbone. Or maybe you're really strong and you do decline sit-ups holding a weight. Although I doubt that. Most people can't do that right, but maybe that's you. But build the abs. Train them like you're trying to build them and get them stronger, not like you're trying to get them to have tons of stamina and endurance. And what you'll find is they'll build and they'll be much more visible. By the way, this was me. I, I used to get down to 9% body fat. And you, if I didn't flex my abs, you couldn't see them. Then I built them. And now you can see my abs when I'm at 12% body fat, just because they're a lot bigger. So if you focus on building them like any other muscle, it'll 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 work better for you. Also keep in mind, there's a genetic component to this too, where some people just carry more bo body fat in their abdominal area and other people don't. And that's why you can probably, or you probably know somebody who you're like, man, I'm leaner than they are, but I can see their abs and I can't see mine. Right. So there's there's a genetic component. But it, 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 Sal's advice is uh, spot on. Like nothing is going to help do that better than building them somewhat and then also getting leaner than you've ever been because they're there. You have abs. Uh, you have you have diced up, shredded abs. Guaranteed you have them. You just got to get down to that body fat percentage or do what Sal is saying, which is, uh, yeah, or uh, ideally that's what, what I, mm -hmm. I think we would train you is I'd run you through like, uh, no BS six pack abs and, and try and bulk in a calorie surplus and then run you into a cut afterwards to try and reveal that. Have you actually like progressively overloaded, uh, your abs and, and worked on it like that? Like you're trying to really build up the strength of your abs. Yeah. Yeah. I've done, um, you know, like weighted crunches, um, along with leg raises, Russian twists. Um, you know, I was going to kind of ask if there's a good way to program them or if you should hit them more often than other body parts. Cause sometimes you hear that you can hit abs every day, but if you're really loading them, should you do them every day or just a couple times a week? Yeah. You can hit any muscle group every day, but you have to adjust the intensity. Yeah. Uh, you can't hit the abs hard. Every single day. We're going to send you the no BS six pack formula. Okay? Yeah, it's all outlined in there and it'll show yeah. you a good blueprint. Also, the, there's a full range of motion for the abs that we often don't hit. Like, remember, it crunches and it rolls up the lower back. But if you bring them to their full extension, 
you actually have an arch in your low back. So if you do a crunch on the flat floor, you're not getting a full range of motion. If I do a crunch and I have like a half foam roller behind my low back, or if I do a really good, and this takes a lot of form and technique, a really good crunch, full range of motion, sit up or crunch on a physio ball. Now I'm getting a full range of motion, extension, contraction. And, and I love doing physio ball sit-ups with my arms extended over my head, like straight. And that's all the resistance I need. And I'm doing like 12 reps really slow. That's plenty of tension to build that up. But we'll send you the no BS six pack form. This so you have like a structured routine that you can follow and then watch the videos in there. Cause I really break down how to do the proper technique and form and, and run it because just like a building any muscle, run it in a bulk. So give yourself a calorie surplus while you're really trying to build and then go to a cut afterwards and, and reveal that's right. the beauty. Wow. Awesome. And is that like Rex. something else, um, kind of in addition to another program? Yeah. So, okay. You cut out there, but I think you, what you said was, is it, is it a whole program by itself or do I add it to something? It's only abs and obliques. So you take the no BS six pack formula, apply it to your current workout, take out whatever you're doing for abs in your current workout and just replace it with the no BS six pack formula and train the rest of your body. Goes great. The with, way you have goes great with maps anabolic. That's a wonderful <laughs> combo with maps anabolic. Yeah. All right, Dylan, have, have a good time there on Mars. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. And see you later. Where, where was he at, Doug? Uh, Minnesota. Oh, yeah. They don't have they don't have internet back. There, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> he, it was that like a, it was like a cup and a string. Really old cell phone towers. <laughs> yeah. 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 No. I, th hey, this is a big one, dude. I still see people training abs oh, and core yeah. this way, and it's like I'm, I, I'm I, telling you, man. I had a flat mid. I would get lean and have a flat midsection, <clears throat> and then all of a sudden I built. And I, you know what? I started noticing. I started getting a pump. And like, how? When's the last time someone got a pump in their abs? Oh, yeah. I started getting a pump in my abs. I'm like, oh, this is interesting. And then they started to build. And it's like, I mean, you got, and now it's like my abs show almost at almost anybody. And I store body fat in my midsection. That's where I store it. So it makes makes a huge difference. You can definitely build them, uh, but you got to train them like you're trying to build them. I brought them. my laundry to wash on your stomach. Damn. <laughs> I didn't tell anybody that. Our next caller is Edward from Washington. Edward, what's happening? How's it going? I'm a big fan of you guys. Been listening for, for a few months now. Thank you. All right. Thanks, man. So I, I just wanted to give a little back story. Um, about a year ago, I weighed 227 pounds. Um, now I'm down to about 167 and I'm trying to cut down and lose body fat. Um, so I started running a 10 K every day. I've been doing that for about uh, 90 days and uh, I strength train five to six days a week. But when I tested my body fat at the beginning and then at the end, I actually increased my body fat by a percent. I'm eating in a caloric deficit and, uh, so I, I don't understand what I am doing wrong. So I, I shared in an, uh, or I shared in one of the episodes not that long ago. Um, I used to do this challenge with all of my trainers, and I, I remember the first time that like the, I really, really saw this happen, like with a group. Right, so I had twenty trainers that were working with, for me at this time, and I put out like some spiff, like if you know the trainer that had the most, the greatest change in body fat percentage over the next, you know, three months would get this cash prize, and the crazy part. What happened to a lot of trainers, in fact, I'd say the majority of them uh, had really bad results. You know, these are trainers, right? They know, they know how to program. They know how to diet. And it's because they all did exactly what you did, which is they, they went to the extreme. They restricted calories. They moved as much as they possibly can to shred as fast as they could. And a, a lot of them lost weight on the scale, but then they saw their body fat percentage go up and everybody was fucking pissed. Like, here we are, trainers, and you know, should know what we're doing. And this... but. What's happening is you you are you're overtraining the body and you're not feeding it enough nutrients for what you're doing. And so the body is paring down muscle. You're, all that activity, not enough nutrients, and the body says, We we don't need all this. We don't need all this muscle to do what you're asking it to do. And it actually pairs down muscle as fast or faster sometimes than you actually lose body fat. Yeah. So you may be wondering how does that make your body fat percentage go up to lose muscle? Think of it this way. Okay. If you're 200 pounds and you have 20 pounds of body fat on your body, that means you're 10% body fat, right? So 10% of your weight is body fat because 20 pounds out of 200 is 10%. Now let's imagine you lose hundred pounds. So you go down to 100 pounds, but you still have 20 pounds of body fat on your body. So you lost hundred pounds of muscle. You are now at 20% body fat. 
right? Because 20 pounds out of 100 is 20%. So you might have lost, you probably lost body fat too. So you, you lost a lot of weight. You probably lost a lot of body fat too, but your body fat percentage went up because the amount of muscle you lost outpaced the amount of, of fat you lost in the context of your total body weight. So your body fat percentage is higher now. Okay. Does that make sense? That does. Okay. So what, what could I be doing that, that would get that body fat down and yeah. increase muscle mass? You got to build muscle. You, you got to build muscle and stop doing so much endurance work. Like yeah. a, a 10 K every day. What that's telling your body to do is become efficient. It's telling you to become a better 10 K running machine, which means lighter. You don't need a lot of strength to do that. Uh, in fact, you need very little strength. And your body burns calories while doing it, so your body's becoming more efficient. Just like a, and just it wants like a to store energy as much as possible. This is all the activity. So you just lose, mu you end up your body pairs muscle down. This is also why you hear us harp about cardio on the show so much. Is you're a perfect example of this because guess what? If we would have changed nothing different about what you did and simply just walked instead of you running those 10 Ks, you would have seen a difference on body fat yeah, percentage. You probably would. So I, here's the thing: you're you're working out way too much too. Anyway, I mean, uh, you're, you're you know five to six days a week of strength training plus running every single day. It's way too much and in a deficit. Yeah, I would have you follow Maps Anabolic. Uh, I would have you walk, not run. Now I don't want you walking for five hours a day. You know, do like a, a thirty to forty five minute walk every day is perfectly fine. Do Maps Anabolic, and then I want you to take your calories. Make sure you hit. Good protein intake. So if you're 167 pounds now, aim for 167 grams of protein a day and get your calories and slowly creep them up. But the most important thing is that you hit your protein targets, 167 grams. If that's your body weight, then hit, hit your body weight in grams of protein. Follow MAPS Anabolic. Stop looking at the scale. Don't look at the scale anymore. And then pay attention to your strength. Am I stronger? Am I lifting more? Do I feel more stable when I squat? And bench press and overhead press, and then give it time. The it's a it's a slower process because it's a snowball effect. When your metabolism really starts to kick in, and it might take a month or two, as it starts to kick in, then you'll start to get leaner. Now, also consider this: your body weight on the scale may not change That's right. because you may build muscle as you burn body fat. You may also you may also notice comments from people who say things like, "Did you lose ten pounds?" Even though you might have gained five pounds on the scale or or nothing at all. So. So follow that advice. Don't overtrain yourself with cardio and stop the, you know, the, the cutting the calories too much. And that should move you in the right direction. Okay. That sounds great. Excellent. Do you have MAPS Anabolic, by the way? Uh, I do not. I, I was undecided. I didn't know which one I should get. I was looking at that or aesthetic um, to kind of figure out. Start with Anabolic. Yeah. You got to do yeah. MAPS Anabolic. We'll, we'll, send, yeah. we'll send that over to you. Okay. So you'll have, you'll have access to it. All right. Thank you, guys. Yep. You All got right, it. Man. Dude, so, so common. Um, and, you know, for listeners and hopefully for Edwards, so he doesn't feel bad. Like, I mean, tra my trainers were all. Yeah, I mean, dude. I've done this. I yes. was part of that competition. Yeah. yeah. I didn't know what I was doing. It's it's just the thing. You, you're just so conditioned. And he's probably an athlete, too, I would imagine, just but based off of, like, you know, how much <laughs> effort he's putting into this whole thing. It's right. like you think that more intensive work is going to produce a better result. And yeah. this is just an example yeah. of it doesn't always work out. We confuse way. lighter and smaller with leaner. Yeah. It's not the same thing. Yeah. I mean, I weigh 200 and, I don't know, 12 pounds. If I was 212 at my current body, at my current height, was six foot, but my body fat was 20% instead of what I'm at now, which is probably around eight or 9%, I would look very different. And I would look, I would be a very different size and shape, right? So leaner, lighter and smaller is not always leaner. And people confuse the two and you lose 50 pounds. You're like, how did my body fat percentage? How, how frustrating well, is this bullshit though? Like, it's the most frustrating like thing. Like literally you know, all that work, he, everything. He could have done less days of strength training and less yeah. running and probably would have seen more results just because of the, the, the opposite, sig the competing signal yeah. that it's he's sending because to the because we value, we have been taught to value the calorie burn more than the adaptations that the exercise routine induces. The calories that you burn while you exercise is the le literally the least important thing of the exercise. It's the least important factor. Of all the factors that you should consider with your workout routine, the one you should consider the least is how many calories I'm burning while I'm doing it. It's actually inconsequential. And in fact, if you value that above everything else, 
you'll end up just like this guy. Well, I just read that he's a he's into Muay Thai fighting, and I remember going through that training. I bet his conditioning is is superb, right? Yeah. Like doing all this excess work because you do see all that work applying well towards the conditioning end of it and the performance side of like really drilling the skill. But now in this pursuit, it, it requires a completely different shift of focus. Well, so, yeah, being a great Muay Thai athlete and building muscle are totally different yeah yep. i mean they're not the same thing and so and this is what happens you get people that kind of want it the, the the best of both worlds it's like well something's gonna give yeah. and what's gonna give in this situation is all that activity your body's gonna be like i don't want to yeah. put more muscle on this body we're running like well, crazy we're fighting all the time like well i hope he takes your advice because you know it's that's a really tough transition that's a hard reversal and again with when it comes to sports the primary goal is to perform better the side effect of which is how you look nobody cares how you look if you perform great I and mean, there's a lot of athletes that don't look like they're shredded, but are incredible athletes. So to your point, Adam, it's like, you know, which one, which one do you want I to hope do? he does take your advice and I hope we hear back from him in a couple months because I think that it'll, it'll blow his mind. If especially if he's got the, like, if he's got the discipline, it sounds like he's got the discipline. Definitely, to, yeah. So if he can switch the mindset from the, you know, huge, this, yeah, this idea yeah. of more work means more results and focus on, on lifting smarter, eating yep. correctly. He'll, it'll huge, be huge, huge difference. Uh, look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find us all on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at mindpumpjustin. You can find Adam on Instagram at mindpumpadam. And you can only find me on Twitter at mindpumpsal. <laughs>